I often think that we're told uh, sometimes that we have a time frame, schedules. And there's a joke in Indian country uh, in the Northwest, uh, be careful about giving the Potawatomi the microphone. <laughs> um, because before we start, before we come to talk, we take the time to go to the Creator. And I have a formula that I follow. I knew this wonderful man named Black Hawk Minthorn. He was the chief of the Cayuse in the Umatilla. When James and I were students at the University of Oregon, I had to give a presentation in a science class. First time I had ever been in a classroom of 300 people, students, and I was quite blown away. I was born in a warehouser logging camp. Um, outside of Klamath Falls, outside of Bly, uh, some of you may know. Um, I was raised in Medford, in Southern Oregon, in rural Southern Oregon. And for 300 students in a classroom, I went to Rogue Community College. We didn't have that big of classes. Thank you. And I was panicked about doing something from Native American relative to science. And so I bugged everybody to death to listen to my presentation. I wrote it all down on three by fives, the whole thing. I had it ready to go. I had a stack of three by fives you couldn't carry. I couldn't fit them in my hand. And I ran it by everybody about every two days in the longhouse. Finally. I was in there one evening, and my presentation was the next day. And Chief Minthorn was there visiting with his son, Antone, and he called me over and he said, David, go get us a cup of coffee and come sit by me a minute. So I went and got a cup of coffee and went and sat down by him. He said, David, he said, you know what I would like you to do for your presentation tomorrow? And I said, what's that, Chief? What, would you, what could I do for you? He said, shut up. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> He said, you know exactly what you need to do. You've run it by every time. And he said, the more you got comfortable with it, the less you looked at those cards. He said, you know in your heart what it is that you want to say, what needs to be said. You've done your preparation. But he said, I want to give you something. Maybe it will help. He said, before I go to conduct business on behalf of the people, he said, I go to the sweat lodge the night before. He said, when I go in that sweat lodge, I only ask one thing of the Creator. I ask for the right words in the right place, in the right way, at the right time, to create no further harm, but only to the good for the people and all our relations. He said, it's never failed me. And from that day, that has never failed me. I left my three by fives at home, and I went and spoke from my heart like he told me to do. And when you ask for those right words and those things in the right way at the right time of the Creator to help you, then how dare we cut off what the Creator gives us as we're delivering it because of an agenda? Whose agenda are we on? Whose time frame are we honoring? If the Creator gives an elder three hours in which to speak, our obligation is to sit quietly by and listen with our full intent until that elder is done speaking, with an appropriate pause at the end to make sure that they haven't missed anything, with appropriate pauses on the way through what's being said, to think before we speak. Words have power. Once given, very hard to take back. And so I'd like you to join with me today as we take just this small time to make some words to the Creator, on our behalf and on behalf of all that is. And so could I ask you to please rise as the family of two-legged. I'd ask you each to join with me in your own understanding, your own way, as we take just this little time. Grandmother, grandfather spirits of all of our people. 
great creator, life maker, breath giver. We give you thanks on this fine and beautiful day. We thank you for the many blessings that you send to us for our nourishment and for our well-being. We thank you for all of the beautiful families of your creation. We thank you for life and for its abundance. We thank you for death and its inevitability. We thank you for the cycle of life in all things. We thank you for the great spirit that lives in all things. We thank you for our children and for our elders, our old people, our treasures, our repositories of knowledge. We thank you for the newborn and those yet to come who bring blessing from the spirit world to us in their innocence, in their beauty. We thank you for the extremely aged who approach you and are close to the spirit world and we appreciate them for their wisdom and their beauty. We thank you for the Mother Earth and all that she provides. We thank you for the food, for the air, for the water, for the fire, and for the Earth herself. We thank you for you, for being, for creating all of this that abounds us and ties us together. We thank you for this good house we thank you for the spirit that emanates from it and the spirit that was put into it by the love of the people. Creator, we are here discussing many important things about the future of our country. And we're asking to expand our thought to the future of our world, of our earth. For we realize that it isn't just about one place, but it's about all places and about all things. Help us to have open minds and open hearts, to listen, to share, to find a good direction for the seventh generation that lies before us, and in respect and honor to the seven generations that lie behind us, and the seven before that, and the seven before that, and the seven after seven, and the seven after seven yet to come. We ask that you help our hearts to be good, that you wipe away all anger and sickness from those that are able to hear and be with us today. We ask that you watch over those in the hospitals, the nursing homes, the iron houses across the country, those that are living in the bridges and under the bridges and in the dark places, those that have hunger and have no place to lay their head upon you except upon you. Nurture them when they lay their head upon you. Heal them through their bodies who lay naked on you. And give them help and comfort. And guide them to a better and healthier way. To a happy life. All these things we ask in the best way that we know how. From the depth of our heart and our being. And the life that you give us. And all these things we are ever humble before you. And we give you thanks. And we give you thanks. Egwin Shimonitu. Aho. If you have water, please drink water. Chush. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Sacred places. And here we are in one, all together. Once again, they tell us, you know, that whoever is here is supposed to be here. You're here because you chose to be here. And I hope that what we have to share with you today is beneficial to you and is something that you can take into your uh, practices, into your employment, into your lives, and that it has something that um, is meaningful for you. Um, could I get somebody to start the loop? Of the on the video, please. Okay, thank you. When we talk about sacred places, I always have to do a little bit of a preface here. I'd like to ask you a question. 
This is a question that I ask my students, and I've been asking my students. I've been a classroom teacher for about 28 years now. And I ask my students every term the same question. How many of you got more than, oh, maybe a couple of few pages, maybe part of a unit, part of a lesson plan, somewhere and maybe in the seventh grade about a social studies or a history class about American Indians? Who got more than that about American Indians in your K through 12 experience? Could you raise those hands right way, way up on there? Uh, could everybody look around? Just a little bit more than that. Where did you grow up? Go to school. Eastern Washington, a lot of Indians over there. A lot of Indians over there. And this lady? I grew up here, and my grandma was Choctaw. So you have that background, and a fine, one of the finest Indian ed programs under Twyla Sowers in the nation. Many times, uh, she, this program here, when Twyla Sowers ran the Indian ed program in Eugene Springfield, it was nationally acclaimed um, as the, high, the best Indian ed program in the nation. Yes? I've been sharing her culture with you, uh, part not particularly in school, but as a relationship. Um, other folks? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. A lot of us Indians in Wisconsin. And I taught it. Mm -hmm. And you taught it. Thank you. Uh, my family when I was younger, but then now I teach it. So a family from younger, and now she teaches it. Nothing standardized. Nothing standardized, yes. My elders in the form of books. Elders in the form of books. Does self-research count or? Pardon me? Does like your own research count or just on your own time look up that? Sure, that counts, but it doesn't really count in standardizing yeah. or inclusion. So I could very comfortably probably say that m the majority of you, because there were only four or five hands that went up, the majority of you know little to nothing about us from your K through 12 educational experience. What you know of us is usually and primarily by video, by movies, by books, or by personal experience. I just to admit, I learned pejoratives, and I was puzzled because I saw the Indian people who were right across the state line my whole life. Mm -hmm. But it was a total separation because the school districts were different. So I saw these really nice looking people. You know, they looked good. Not. They were looking good, but who are they? Here, not a lot, mm -hmm. but just at isolated times, there's really nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. so I could I go just, into a real long list of things that we've been called. Scary. Oh, yeah. That's a nice one. Um, I don't want to do that, though. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there in this house Sorry. too long just long enough to help you to think. That's really a very pitiful for me as an educator, as a teacher of Native American history, Native American studies. That's a pitiful statement about our educational system. We're not included. We are not included. Federal forms, reporting forms, used to list us as other. We are the indigenous people of North America. That means first. This is our home. Sacred places. Places that resonate, that speak to us, that have life, that have power, that have meaning and inspiration. How many of you have been out in the woods, walked around out in the woods? And how many of you walking around out there in the woods, you walked into a place that you'd never been before, and all of a sudden you kind of begin to start getting them little goosebumps, hair starting to raise up a little bit on your neck and your arms, on your tailbone. When the hair goes up on your tailbone, the thing to do is be like coyote and <laughs> beat feet out of there. How many of you, when you come up to a place that you get that kind of a feeling, maybe you saw a rattlesnake? Anybody? I'm taught by my Comanche relatives that that means that that one who is considered most loathsome is actually a very, very grand guardian spirit. It's the only one 
that will give you warning. It better not come here. Mm -mm. No, no, no. Better be backing up very carefully and backing out of there. Guardians of the sacred places, the Comanche people, believe they're risen from the rattlesnake. And so they have a relationship with that rattlesnake. Guardian spirits. Guardian spirits. A lot of people say, there I am, sitting on my rock. You notice that Brother Bear, like me, has no butt. <laughs> Most Indian people don't. Most Indian men have no butt. That's because we're patterned a lot like bear. Bear's the go-between between this world and the spirit world. You stand a bear up and you take off his clothes, looks just like a human being. Brother Bear taught us about foods, and medicines, the bear. Taught us lots of things. These sacred sites are all across the land. They may not look like much, maybe on the surface until you spend a little time there. But who gets to say that that's a sacred site? And what do we do to protect those sacred sites? How do we live with them? How do we enjoy them? How do we minister to them? It's said in that uh, movie uh, about Devil's Tower that a place like that needs to be cared for in light of reverence. In light of reverence. That every so often they need to be gone to and maybe a song sung there. To recognize that spirit that's in all things. Manitou in my language means spirit in all things. Kje Manitou means spirit in all things. Spirit, place where at the time of the great flood, the Shlinket people believed they were transported to the top of that mountain by Keet, killer whale. The time of the flood. The Maori people believed that at the time of the flood, first man came riding on the back of a killer whale with tattoos on their body. About 18 years ago, a Klinkit chief named Donawak, Austin Hammond, traveled to New Zealand at the request of the Maori people to meet with the oldest Maori chieftain. I was living in Alaska at that time, and my good friend was an Athabascan elder. And he was invited and went with Donawak and his people to meet with the Maoris. And he said, we had to travel long ways Boy, David, he said, every little crossroad, he said, there'd be all these people standing by the side of the road, have all of these wonderful gifts and stuff. He said, by the time we got where we were going, he said, I couldn't even see the road. I had all these blankets and coats and everything piled up on me and food and stuff. He said, I was carrying it all. He said, I couldn't even see out of the car. And we got there, and he said, we had to go in this building. It had a big carved screen on the front of it. He said, had these great big men, David. Howard was about this tall. They had these great big men, David, and they had these great big spears. And they were standing there with their arms out, and they were beating those spears. And we had to give them a password to get by. He said, boy, I was pretty scared because I wasn't sure how to say that password. He said, but I made it all right, and we got in there. As soon as we got in there, the eldest elder was sitting on one side. He called for Donawak. Donawak went to him. And they met. And the Maori elder said, I know the reason that you've come here. And the answer is the children. In order to save your ways, your language, and all the things that you fear that you're losing, you have to start with the children. You have to sing them the songs, tell them the stories, and speak to them in their language while they're still in the womb. That way they come to this world and to this life fully knowing who they are with no sense of confusion. And that was the gift. That was the whole purpose for the journey. But in that sense of giving, 
they had a giveaway. And they gifted my friend Howard with this carved wooden screen. Wooden carving picture. Beautiful. Beautifully done. And it's of tattooed man, first man, riding on the back of the killer whale towards the shore. Donawak got up the clinket chief and went to the screen as Howard was holding it and he interpreted the tattoos of the man riding on the back of killer whale as clinket tattoos. The Maori chief jumped up and hollered, see, I have told you all before, we are the same people. We're from those people. First man came from these people. Now wrap your head around that one. Just recently found copper in the Pharaoh's tombs that comes from the only source of copper that that's high, uh, that high of grade is from Lake Superior. Hmm, how's that? Lake Superior copper is in the Pharaoh's tombs. Can you say trade? Sailing ships. There's a new text out, a new book, 1491, 1490 and 1492, really blowing some holes in some old theories about how we got here and who was first here and who discovered America. There were people visiting North America long before Christopher got lost and ended up out there. Poor fellow, you know. He was lost when we found him. <laughs> Perhaps we should have left him lost. I don't know. That's, that's a matter for history to determine, not me. Look at that. Remember yesterday, the color of the acid leaching out of the ground? I prefer this color to the acid leaching out of the ground. The natural place with the sunlight. Sacred sites, they're all around us. It's been said that this longhouse is sacred and truly that it is. It was sacred before we ever turned the first shovel full of dirt. Where's the Holy Land? Winona LaDuke has a great thought about that. The Holy Land is everywhere. The land itself is holy. Now just think how differently we might approach politics if all of our world leaders considered the earth as holy. And that what we did to her might be ripping our mother's breast. When I see people flick cigarette butts on the ground, I go and ask them to pick it up because who would throw trash on their mother? When I see people flying down the road and out goes the McDonald's wrappers and sack. I will chase them down. <laughs> I'll take their license plate number and I will turn them in. What right do we have to do that? What right do we have to scar her to the point that she can't be replaced or replenished. She can't be fixed, she can't be healed. When we take all of that oil out, has anybody ever thought, am I the only one that thinks that maybe we're sucking all of the shock absorber fluid out of the earth? Because what's there after you take all the oil out? Great big holes, great big holes held up by some pretty fragile infrastructure, kind of like Los Angeles. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, no offense to any folks in Los Angeles, but turn those lights off in the parking lots, will you? You folks that are listening from Los Angeles, please turn the lights off in those empty parking lots. Maybe we'll save a little water from Colorado and Oregon and Washington and other places. Turn them off. I drive by and I see trophy homes lit up. And there's two people that live there. Turn them lights off. And why do people move into the country? To be with nature? 
to be with the country, to have that good feeling, and they have the brightest yard light for four miles. You couldn't, it's brighter than the daylight. I have a BB gun. <laughs> and I have a neighbor with this huge yard light. The thing is this big around. And it comes on at dusk and it makes a noise. And I live way out in the country. But you can hear that, or you could hear that. <laughs> I went and talked to them. I didn't, I didn't take it out. <laughs> it crossed my mind. I have to be honest, it crossed my mind. But I went and talked to him. I said, what are you guys afraid of? What are you afraid of? Well, well we're not afraid. Really? Why did you move to the country? To be in the country. But you're not afraid. No. Then why do you have that yard light on? So we can see if anything's in the yard. <laughs> I guarantee you stuff's in the yard. You live in the country. <laughs> You turn on the lights, you draw the bugs. You draw the bugs, you draw the bats. You draw the bats, you draw other stuff. You draw the night hawks. Um, you leave the lights on, you light up the way for Brother Raccoon to find that trash can. All right, we're that family of skunks, Mama Skunk to say, right this way across the big sunlit yard, kids, right here, <laughs> right under the porch, right there. That's good, tuck right in there, be nice and warm. <laughs> is your home a sacred place? A sacred site? I think so. How do we feel about those sometimes uninvited and after a little while perhaps unwanted guests living under the front porch? How do we get rid of them? Do we kill them all? Poison them? You ever see an animal die from poisoning? I have. Somebody poisoned my dog. Whew. That's tough to watch. It's even tougher to bear. Poison. Poison. What does nuclear radiation do to the soil? When we put that stuff in the ground, and we know, I said yesterday, the half-life is ridiculous in the steel containers as compared to what they're trying to hold. How come we allow this to keep happening? Where's our voice? It seems sometimes so hopeless. And then I look at Native history because I teach it. Every winter for 21 years, I've taught contact to 1890, first wounded knee. My old heart and spirit is just about done teaching that. I can't hardly bear it. This is an ugly, 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 ugly history in our country. There is a genocide perpetuated against American Indian people, not only in the physical form, but in the form of language, in the form of family. In every form that you can imagine, we were assailed from every side. Where are we in the political dis discussions of today? Where are we? Nowhere. Nowhere. In our house. All day yesterday, I never heard one word from any of the other presenters about American Indians and their place in the democratic process. The democratic process that was stolen from the Iroquois League of Nations and perpetuated by the Continental Congress. If you don't believe me, Look it up. We have it in the written form of the secretaries of Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. We're sent there to observe the formation of the Iroquois League. Representative democratic political process, all based in the tree of peace. Peace. How did it get so subverted? How did that teaching, that great vision, become so twisted that the originators of it are no longer included within it? 
If you don't know anything about us, extrapolate that to the knowledge of the United States. How many people know anything about us? You saw the percentage right here in front of you. It's the same every class. Last term I had 36 students in my class, first time in about four years that I asked that question. There was not one hand raised. Historically, all this time, it's been the same thing in response to that. The hands that are raised are people that lived close by large populations of Native people or had very active Native programs in their communities or were self-taught. Nothing in the schools. We don't even have a Native American history course taught by the history department at our university. Do you at U of O? That's pretty pitiful. Just now getting a class, four basic classes in Native American studies for graduating teachers, bachelor's level, to go on into master's programs. That started 12 years ago. My colleague is James's younger brother, Brent. We went to do a workshop for 80 graduating master's candidates with initial licensure in the public school system. 80. All of them social studies teachers. 80 of them. I asked them the first question, how many of you can name the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon? Out of that 80 students, not one. So we started counting down. Eight, seven, six, Five, four, three. Finally, somebody got three. It was the three tribes with casinos. <laughs> That's how they knew about us. How many of you can name the nine tribes of Oregon? Couple. Good class, huh? Yeah. <laughs> A professor and two advanced students. How many of the rest of you from Oregon? These are sovereign nations in your state. Sovereign nations with the ability to have self-determination no longer has to be allowed by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. We're taking that back in relative ways. 15 points of life, sacred sites identified just in this part of the United States. Sacred sites. They're everywhere. There's a sacred site that lives inside of you. It's this life force. It's this life fire. Heard people last night talking about what plans are we going to make for 25 years from now? What's it going to be 25 years? That's way too short. We use this concept of seven generational planning. What are we doing here right today? What I'm saying, what James just told you, and what the rest of these fine presenters are talking to their colleagues and associates and friends and community about, what impact is it going to have seven generations from today? And how do we honor that seven generations that were from behind? How many of you can go back seven generations in your people, your family, your genealogy? What were they doing to plan for you sitting in this longhouse today? Can you find that within your mind, within your being, within your ancient memory that connects you to all of your family from the beginning time? Everybody sitting in this room, no matter what people that you're from, no matter where in the world you originated, everyone in this room and listening in, all of us started at one time in the history of the world as tribal people and took our living from the land. Walmart wasn't here yet. Neither was Seb Maleb. You had to go out and get it and work for it. Bottled water. I found the emphasis for the remainder of my life two years ago at this conference. There were some people who had a test table in the back. And they were selling 
these little drops of water for 12 bucks. $12. And I thought, $12 for a drop of water? We're not supposed to have to buy the water. We are water. Water was given to us as the life-giving, life-saving, nurturing thing. We're water. But I went back and bought it before I made my speech. <laughs> I thought, hmm, people tell me that I paint pictures with words. I hope so. What an honor. I thought, I'm going to use my words. I'm going to use what I have left of my life and my time as a teacher and as a human being, as a grandpa, as a person approaching elder time, to speak about the water and about the world and about life. This is my reminder every day that somewhere in the course of my day, I speak about water and the sacredness of water. The most powerful, most powerful of all of the medicines, pure, clean water. Can heal cancer, you know, if applied in the right way. I believe that. Water. It'll change inside you. The same way that that study has shown that it'll change if you put it in a glass and you say good words to it, a clear glass, and you write good things, affirmations, thank you, gratitude, wellness, life, sustainable, gratitude, thank you. And then look at a drop of that water under a microscope through a great process and it's in its crystalline form, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful, it's all whole, it's sacred. You take that same drop of water, that same glass of water, and you put hate, anger, war, filth, nasty, terrible stuff on there. And you look at that same drop of water under that microscope, and it'll look like sewer sludge. It has no form. It's broken down, it's melted, it's dirty, it's lifeless almost. You take that same glass, you take those ugly words off, you put the positive words back on there, leave it 20 minutes, do the test on it, and it's back to its crystalline form. So one of the oldest things that I know is called a four-day water ceremony. It's beautiful. I'm going to give you some things today about sacred places. See this place right here? How many of you have been there? Isn't it fine? Three days before we took a field trip to Crater Lake at our Native Youth Academy, we talked about this gentleman named Corbin Harney. He was a Shoshone medicine man. And he was from the people in Nevada where nuclear testing has gone on for years and years. And he was a tremendous voice and advocate for the stopping of nuclear destruction, particularly on Western Shoshone lands. And he told us, he said, water, most powerful medicine that there is, pure, clean water, most powerful medicine that there is. So three days later, we're at Crater Lake. And the ranger is telling all of our kids and all of us, you know that lake right there? He said, this is the only one in the world like this. This is the only high mountain lake of its kind uh, formed by volcanic action. The other high mountain lakes are formed by uh, glacier action. He said, this is the deepest, clearest, and purest water that we know of in this lake right here. And then the ranger left. Grandma Aggie, Agnes Baker Pilgrim, she marched us right over to the edge and she said, my children, look down there. She said, where's the most powerful medicine in all the world? Everybody pointed at Crater Lake. But we didn't stampede down there to fill our water bottles. We recognized it and we gave it thanks for what it is. We don't tell that very much. And I don't want anybody to get any ideas about putting a bottling factory in there. You leave that lake alone. Some places just need to be left alone. 
Leave the gold, leave the oil, leave the gas, leave the trees, just leave them alone. Go there and visit. Say thank you. Be respectful. Wonder and marvel at the creator. What an artist. Wow, what an artist. You can step right outside this back door and see a panorama that people would pay hundreds of dollars, maybe even thousands of dollars for an oil painting or a picture done in series across there, big, nice, wide layout out there. Gorgeous. But you can step right out there and you can take that picture in your mind and you can put it in your heart and you can carry it forever. Huh? That was very limp. Huh? All right. Once again, everybody awake? All right. You are now, huh? Okay. Don't make me have to get my Alaska jump start out here. How many of you ever had an Alaska jump start? Anybody? Okay. We won't have to go. <laughs> We're not going to go there. <laughs> Look at this. My student found this. I want to thank my student, Maya Gawicki, for helping put together this beautiful uh, presentation. 160 feet at space between 2,000 and 3,000 years old. Wow. Does that look better as that or as a Walmart parking lot? How about a little RV park right down here at the bottom, a spider woman's rock? I understand we're on the World Wide Web. Does that mean we're being covered and protected by a dream catcher? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. How many of you know the concept behind them dream catchers? Good. Iktomi, spider woman. She was from the people. She was from my people. And she loved the little kids. And some women came to her and they said, the little children are having these terrible dreams, terrible, terrible dreams, waking them up in the night and they're scared. They're awful. They're awful. We would know them as nightmares. And so Spider Woman, she thought about it, she thought about it, she thought about it. She, well, I'll make something to catch those bad dreams and only let the good dreams go through. And so she made this beautiful circle, used a willow hoop. And she made this beautiful circle and she made this beautiful web. And she put a few little drops of dew on some of the strands that helped to catch the bad dreams as they went through and put them in those little drops. That's what the beads are for now. And only the good dreams could get through to the children. She said, every so often you take that out and you hang that up in the sunshine. And all of those bad dreams, they're going to burn off in the sunshine because the sun makes everything new again. Clean that dew drop off and take that bad dream out of there. So those of you with dream catchers, take them out in the sun once in a while. Put a little water on them, clean them off a little bit, put them back up there. They'll be all freshened up, all fixed up for you. Spider woman. When the people split apart into three different tribes, the Potawatomi, the Ojibwe, and the Ottawa, when we split, she knew that she wasn't going to be able to take care of all of the children anymore because we were too big. And so she taught the women how to make these dream catchers. Women are the makers of dream catchers in our traditional society, because they make it for the children that they bring into the world. By the way, most tribes in North America, women had a voice in council and they had a right to vote. We didn't need that Equal Rights Amendment. In the Iroquois League that I mentioned just a little bit ago, if a chosen leader wasn't doing their job, the grandmothers were the ones that had the right to take them out. Now, how would that work today? Very well, perhaps. Water, four days. In the evening time, at dusk time, the time between two worlds, the sunrise and the sunset, dawn and dusk. That's a magic time right there. And if you've sat outside during those times, you know that that kind of feels a little magic. The color of the air and everything changes. The earth changes. It all makes this change. 
And so if we draw a glass of water in a clear glass and we address it, however you might choose to do so. Hello, water, how are you today? Um, mm, please. In your language, in another way, in another form, maybe even a prayer. You talk to that water and you ask it to become the medicine overnight that you need within your being for the betterment and the well-being of body, mind, spirit, emotion. Four parts of the human being. Body, mind, spirit, emotion. And you set that in an east-facing window. This would be the east over here. <laughs> I'm going to catch it after a little bit, you know, for that one. But, you know, brothers are like that. <laughs> In the morning, after first light, I mean you have to get up at daybreak, at sunrise, which is good though. Get up early, greet the day. You'll be amazed at how different you feel. You drink that water, you take it out of that window and you thank it for becoming that medicine overnight for which you might have need in body, mind, spirit, or emotion. And you drink it with thankfulness and gratitude. Four days, four days time. See how different you feel. This does not belong to me. This is not my knowledge. This is passed down knowledge and wisdom. And I heard something yesterday, and in particular, I've been dealing with grief, and I seem to have been dealing with grief for a long time in my professional career. Uh, I deal with the side of death quite often as a counselor. My master's degree is in community psychology, and I am a social psychologist, so I understand all of the sociological implications of this conference as well as the psychological. I'm here to tell you you need to get more spirit in your political movement. It's not going to go too far if it isn't guided by spirit of some kind. It keeps running into those difficulties, ways of miscommunication. that four-day water ceremony. It's one of many things like that, that we, it's so old we don't even know where it came from. We don't know what people it originated in. We just know that it is. And so that is a gift that I pass on to you the same as it was passed on to me. But I heard several times yesterday people talking about grieving, about sorrow, and about loss. Native American people have been grieving the loss of many things for a really long time. We deal often, I deal often, with Indian people who have an impotent rage, an impotent anger, so angry at the treatment and the non-inclusion still to this very day that they're angry inside. Who are you angry at? Them. Who's them? Well, I don't know. Them. The government. Them. The BIA, them. The superintendent, them. Them, them, them. Who's them? Can you put a finger on them? No. Well, what you gonna do with that anger? Impotent rage. It has nowhere to go. And so we swallow it and it will make us sick. So, that impotent rage, how do you deal with that? You go to a sacred site. You go to the running water, a river, some place where you have some space. You take a little bit of tobacco, unaltered tobacco. American Spirit sells tobacco with no additives. Use that. Doesn't have to be much, just a little bit. You go to the river. How many of you like rocks? Uh -huh. How many of you got rocks in your pocket right now? Ah, ah, me too. All right. How many of you got rocks in your head? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> you take that tobacco and you ask However you believe, you ask the Creator, you ask the earth, you ask the river, you ask the stone people for one to come and help you. Stones, firstborn, 
Mother Earth, firstborn, stone people. And as you're walking along, you know how they are. They'll throw a little flicker of light over here somewhere, and you'd notice that one. Be a certain color or a shape, and you, you might even be drawn back to it. You might be walking along, be a little shadow that flicks over here, and you look, and there's that stone over there. It says, I want to go with you. Don't just take it willy-nilly. If you're going to go someplace where you know the rocks might, are going to be, like the beach that you might want to have one, take a few rocks from home. And when you get there, you trade one. Huh? No. Nah. Huh? Nah. Okay. So, you take that stone that came to you, and you go by that running water. It's important that it's running water. Pretty good size, maybe. Running water. Really important that it's running. Pretty good. Where you can kind of hear it, little riffles and stuff. Oxygenating that water. You take that stone, and if you just take a minute, put your hands together. Match up the lines in your hands. Match them up. Go ahead. Match them up. Mm. Roll them together. Yeah, now make just a little bit of space right in between them right there. Just a little bit of space right there. How many of you can make your hands hot? Ah, those are the masseuse people. I'll be seeing you back here just about 15 <laughs> minutes after the presentation. <laughs> make your hands hot. The Eskimo people means that, say that that means you have healing in your hands. If you can make those hands hot. It's also called biofeedback. I prefer the other have healing in your hands. You put that stone in there in between those two halves of your being that when you put them together and your feet are planted firmly on the earth and you put them together, you make a circle of your body. Your energy is unified. So you put that stone in there. Now stone people are born in compression. They understand and they know compression. And sometimes we have that anger, those hurts, those wounds that are so deep inside our sacred place that when we try to bring them up and say them, they get about right here and you can't get it out. You swallow it. Where does it go? Right to your liver. And so then we try to medicate our liver and our anger and keep it down. Keep it down because it's got no place to go. I can't even talk about it. But it'll make us sick. You don't have to say anything with the stone people. You don't have to put it out your mouth. You only bring it up as far as your shoulders. Let it run out your shoulders and your arms and out in your hands and into that stone. You compress it into that stone. And you take the time and you give yourself permission to cry. You give yourself to put that impotent rage in there. You can just, and you can tell them, you dirty, rotten, fretsin, 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 flop this down on the ground, kick, stomp, roll around, scream, holler, yell. <laughs> Bill Cosby calls it the sup -sups. When you get back to the sup -sups, you start to come back to yourself just a little bit. You've got it, now you've got it all in the stone. Now it's in there. You take that stone and you launch it down into the river. You watch which way it goes. You watch it go out there and then you imagine Mother Earth floating on her back as the river. Mother Earth, and she says, Huh? Yeah. She can take it. Watch that little bloop as it hits the water. And there goes all of that anger and all of that stuff and all that business right off down river. Where it's going to wash up on a gravel bar or the beach. It's going to make it to the ocean. And she's going to take it and she's going to break it down against the headlands with the tides, with the ocean, until finally it returns to its liquid form in the form of that stone. 
the piece of sand finally becomes the water once again. And they start all over again. That's a fine ceremony. Again, that's so old, we don't even know where it came from. Hmm? Yep. We'll give you one more. And then there's a question and answer. I'll try to hurry. Once again, I got something to say. I don't know that I'll be here tomorrow. None of us know that. I don't know that I will be alive tomorrow. No one of us do. That's why they say, tell those that you love that you love them before the sunset of each day. That's a wisdom that comes from white buffalo calf woman and her teaching with the sacred pipe to the Lakota people. Tell those that you love that you love them before the end of each day because you never know that the sun will rise tomorrow. Yesterday's gone. Tomorrow's not here yet. We have today. If you have loss, if you have sorrow, if your sacred place is afflicted, if the petroglyphs of your life and your family are troubled and overbound, you can take a piece of dry cedar wood. Dry cedar wood. It can be a shingle. Get the ones that are not treated for fire retardant. Regular cedar shake. Just a little one. Doesn't have to be very big. And again, at dusk time, you find a quiet place, a place that's for you. And you can't write this down, so anybody out there listening, don't write this down. Listen. Listen. Put it in here. Listen. You take that stick, and you just make a little pile of shavings, just a little teepee of shavings, dusk time, evening time. You light that on the east side. The east side reflects new day and new life, new beginning. You light that with a wooden match on the east side, that little pile of shavings on first night. And on that first night, then you say to that loved one, that place, that pet, whatever it is that you grieve for. We grieve for all kinds of things every day whatever it was, and you didn't get a chance to tell them, you say to them whatever it was that you wanted to say to them and you didn't get to before they left. How powerful is that? Whew. Probably give yourself permission to cry because you're probably going to. You may even sob because you're going to be down on your hands and knees lighting that little fire. You cry, you weep, you say whatever you needed to say. Again, with that appropriate pause. And on that first night, you don't push any of the little ends up to burn up. You just let it burn out. After you light it, just let it burn out. Don't mess with it after that. When you're done, when you've come back to yourself and you feel like you're completed, the fire's burnt down, you go and you wash your face, you have a drink of water, you go about the business of your living. Huh? No. Second night. Second night. Same time of day. Dusk time. This time a little bit further to the west. Very important. To the west. Just a little ways. Remember these don't have to be big. Uh, amount of smudge used is directly proportionate to amount of ego involved. <laughs> so, just a little bit. You make that same pile of shavings. You light it on the east side. And on that second night, if there was anything that you forgot to say on first night, you say it on that second night, at the beginning of that second night. Then you've said everything that you needed to say and your heart is unloaded, your spirit is unloaded, your sacred place has opened itself and cleansed itself. On that second night, after you have finished with all of that, of what you needed to say, then you begin to think about forming memories of that loved one. What is it that I want to keep? What is it I want to remember about them? What do I want to hold? And when the fires burn down, again, you don't push any of the little ends up. You let it burn out. You go and you wash your face. You have a drink of water. And you go about the business of your living. Huh? No. That second night. Third night. This time a little bit further to the west again. Now on third night, third day is much more purposeful. On third night, 
same time, dusk time, you're going to make a little bit bigger pile of shavings. Just a little bit bigger pile of shavings. And in the day, you go and you find what were that person's favorite foods, favorite things to drink. And you take just a little bits of that. You put them in the fire. That's called feeding the fire as part of the ceremony. And you, in essence, have a last meal with that loved one. You put a little bit of that cheeseburger in there, a little bit of French fries, maybe a little fry sauce on there in that. Uh, maybe a couple of little drizzles of Coca-Cola, not Pepsi, Coca-Cola <laughs> in there. <laughs> Whatever was their favorite thing, you have a last meal with them. And when that fire has burned down, once again, you don't push any of the little ends up, just let it burn out. You go and you wash your face, you have a drink of water, and you go about the business of your living. Huh? That's third night. Fourth night and final night. Once again, a little bit further to the west. About the same size pile of shavings as you had on third night. You light it on the east side at dusk time. As it's going, you go back to second night, second half, and you bring forward those memories that you started to formulate on second night. You bring them out on fourth night and you make them solid, and you make them real, and you put them into your being, into your mind, into your memory, into your personal scrapbook of how you're going to remember that person, how you're going to honor their life. And on fourth night, and now fourth night only, as the fire begins to burn down, you take all the little end pieces and you push them up in the fire. You push them up in there till they get as burned up as good as you can. Because that signifies that you've come to a conclusion of this ceremony. It's not an end, it's a conclusion to that ceremony. And then when you look at the psychology of all of this, after you've pushed all those little pieces of fire up in there, you go in, when it's all burned out, you go and you wash your face, you have a drink of water, and you go about the business of your living. Because at that point it has become about the living. That loved one has gone. And so when we look at the psychology of that, we look at on that first night, there's going to be denial. There might even be anger. I can't believe that this has happened. I just can't believe that this has happened. I'm so mad at you. Why did you leave? You left me with all this work to do and all these kids to raise and there's a crop in the field and I'm so mad that you left. I just can't even believe that this has happened. How many of you recognize that feeling? Or know people that have had that feeling? On second night, you begin to kind of maybe make some deals. If I could just see you one more time, if I could just hear your voice again, I'd be peaceful, I'd be content. If I could just that one, just that one little thing, you begin to bargain. And we wash our face and we have a drink of water. We go about the business of our living. Third night, you begin to start to kind of come to a sense of acceptance. Well, this has happened. They are gone. They're going to be gone. Well, I'm going to remember them. I'm going to have supper with them. I'm going to have dinner. I'm going to have lunch. I'm going to have this last little meal. I'm going to have that warm feeling in my heart begin to find that little piece of acceptance. And on fourth night, hopefully you come to a sense of resolution. And you followed then the five stages of grief in this four-day ceremony that you can do as many times as you want and you need to do it, and it costs you little to nothing to do. You don't have to have anybody else. It's between you and that loved one and the maker. And hopefully then it restores you to balance. It restores you to that place of being able to go on the next day and accept the fact that it has then become about the living. It's going to come to each and every and all of us and everything. It's part of the life cycle that we share with everything. 
Therefore, how are we so different from the sacred places? Treat the earth well. It was not given to you by your parents. It was loaned to you by your children. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Protect Native American sacred sites and protect the sacred site that lives within you. I thank you for, and I thank the elders for passing these things down. I thank you for being here and for listening. And I hope that in some way, what's been shared with you here today will be a benefit to you and that your heart will be blessed, that your spirit will be comforted and that you will be strengthened to go on into the future to make changes in our world for the betterment of all life upon this Mother Earth, which we all share. Thank you, and may the Creator bless us each and every one until we come together again. Thank you.